Hello everyone. Hi. I really want to thank all of you for coming out today. It is so nice to see familiar faces today. A big hi and welcome to all joining us on the Zoom platform and YouTube. If this is your first time, my name is Justice George and I am coming from United Arab Emirates and we from the SOW Streams of Water want to extend a warm welcome to all of you. Yes, this is our first program on 2021. In the last program we had on December 2020, the name, the title of the program was December to Remember. The program had a lot of uh, uh, shadow play, skit, mimes, and uh, we had a program that was meant for Christmas and uh, brother Jim Matthew had led to make us understand or give us the real meaning of what Christmas is all about. A meaningful way to remember what Jesus Christ has done for us. For all who have missed out on that, you can check it out on our YouTube channel, Streams of Water India. I want to le let you know that we have a special time for Q&A just after the sermon. You can post your questions to Ronnie Abraham. If you have logged in from the uh, Zoom platform, you can go down to the participants and uh, you will find Ronnie Abraham right at the top and you can message him via chat. Or you can send your questions anonymously via the pigeonhole application. The links will be posted right at the chat box or the links uh, will be www.pigeonhole.at uh, w4, uh, w4k2021 I'll be just taking up the presentation where you will be able to uh, see and you can uh, post your questions anonymously. Yeah. So this is the link. Uh, you can go to www.pigeonhole.at forward slash w4k2021 and you can post your questions anonymously. So far, as we go ahead with the se sessions, let us ask God for the blessing of our time together. As we long for our soul, we need Holy Spirit to speak to us. And uh, now I would like to request our brother Daniel J. Mearns from New Jersey Woodside Chapel to help us with the prayer and for the blessing of this meeting. Good morning, everyone. Good to see everyone. Many of you I've met and love very, very much. And uh, Nate, we've prayed for you, and we look forward to hearing your message and being focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. So let's open up in prayer. Father, we're so thankful that regardless of geographical area, you have given us the technology to get together and spend time together as brothers and sisters in Christ and part of the body of Christ to uh, focus our attention on our wonderful Savior to, one, to focus our attention what it is to have a relationship uh, with you here in this world in spite of all of the chaos and the confusion. Above all, Lord, we thank you for your love to us. We thank you for dying for us. We thank you for forgiving us and washing away our sins in your precious blood, Lord. And then with this common bond in Christ being bound together by one spirit into one body now, Lord, we just pray that as we hear this message, we will be focused on our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask a blessing on Nate as he presents your word, that he might do so, that would do it in a way that would encourage and challenge and uh, keep our minds on our Savior. Thank you for this time, and we ask a blessing, and in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Daniel. We would be playing a video uh, this is a video that will uh, just show us as a team and for all of us, uh, all of the ones who have logged on, uh, it is a video reminiscence of what SOW 
uh, had done the programs for the last one year. Wow, all glory to God. As the last statement goes, all glory to God. And it was indeed uh, a great last year as for us and for all of you. Um, as we see, uh, Streams of Water was born out in the midst of a lockdown. And uh, we 11 of us from different locations as uh, uh, our brother prayed. Uh, from different locations in India and abroad, uh, Streams of Water is a group of youngsters with a burden to equip youth and young couples with the biblical truth. Our goal is to create an impact in their lives for the glory of Christ and for the expansion of His kingdom. It is our passion to hold meetings like this and address topics which will help us to recapture our awe for God and for God alone. And uh, this uh, last year, we dealt with a lot of topics, starting with our brother Nate, with spiritual dryness. And uh, we had gone through different speakers to just give us uh, impact or a change in how we thought and how we uh, looked on to different of our issues and uh, about discerning God's will and about spiritual warfare and how fellowship mattered to us and uh, ending with a real meaning of what uh, Christ is or what Christmas really means to us. And uh, we, thank for, we thank all of the ones who have been with us all through this last year meetings. And for today's topic, uh, today's topic as we have seen in the poster, the today's topic is Wired for Kingdom wired for the kingdom and uh, in relation to the in relation to that uh, topic i will just uh, read a verse and then i will introduce the speaker please uh, turn with me to second corinthians chapter 5 and reading verses 15 second corinthians chapter 5 and reading verses 15 and he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves but for him who for their sake died and was raised once again and he died for all that those who live might no longer live for themselves but for him for their sake died and was raised wow what what an amazing voice to look on to what christ has prepared and what our priorities are for his kingdom we have all waited for our chief guest to speak to us now may I invite our chief guest, Nate Bramson. Nate Bramson was born in Senegal and has spent majority of his life in an African continent. While working with the street children in Middle East, he founded the Rock International, an organization seeking to be the lap of Jesus. For children trapped in situation of crisis, he now oversees 
development projects while carrying out global itin and media ministry under the banner into your bible ministries he is also the author of the books what if jesus meant what he said and also prosper enjoying intimacy with god nate together with his wife priyanka and their daughter have they have a passion for this generation to become followers of jesus christ and to see unreached souls access with the gospel now without a wait i would uh, love to invite our brother nate and over to you nate Thank you very much, Justice, and uh, all of you at Streams of Water. And it's been a privilege to walk alongside you just even a little bit this past year and see how the Lord is using you. And as we know, some plant, some water, but God gives the increase. And he who plants is nothing, and he who waters is nothing, but God who gives the increase. And we have to always keep this in mind, even now as we go to the Word of God let me remind you, and, and our brother Dan prayed specifically, he prayed that we would be focused on the Lord Jesus. And let me just encourage you, keep your focus there. We're going to discuss many things, Lord willing, over the next 40 minutes. But as we discuss these things, they all come back to the face of Christ and bringing glory to him and knowing him intimately. And so let me remind you, even as I speak, and you might not hear speakers say this often, but Whatever I say, take it back to the word of God and see if it be so. And anything you get that's good, that's from the Lord. Anything that, 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 uh, that you say, hey, what's up with that? You've got to go back to the word and say, is God saying this or is man saying this? And so I just want to encourage you, as in the book of Acts chapter 17, be a Berean and test these things with the word of God. Now, that being said, we're going to be in the Word of God. We're going to be focused on the Word of God, and I pray that each of our lives will be challenged and ultimately changed. And also, as was already mentioned multiple times, we're going to have questions at the end. If you feel something's not maybe been practically applied, please feel free to ask those questions. Don't hesitate whatsoever. Our topic today is Wired for the Kingdom. Wired for the Kingdom. And I love this topic because I believe that it would be something very much on the heart of the Lord Jesus as it was during his earthly ministry when he walked among us. And why do I say that? Well, the kingdom, it's a topic that can be easily misunderstood. And I'm not going to get too much into, per se, the kingdom of God, but it will come out clearly as we discuss it. But the kingdom, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven was a topic that Christ discussed well over 100 years times in the gospels now i would say anything that christ discusses over a hundred times in the gospels is something he's saying pay attention to this and, and as we think about what he said well what was his first real message that he delivered and it was delivered many times he said repent for the kingdom of god or the kingdom of heaven is at hand it's interesting what he's even saying here, because I want you to think about this in the terms of our 2021 world. In other words, he was saying, repent because God's kingdom, the kingdom of God is at hand. It's here. It's before you. But that's not the typical way of, uh, let's say, calling somebody to a kingdom's rule per se. Well, why would I say that? Normally, kingdoms didn't come and say, hey, change the way that you're living, change your direction in life because uh, this kingdom is here. No, no, no. Kingdoms were not an invitation. Kingdoms were an imposition. In other words, kingdoms imposed their rule. Do you think Rome came to areas like Jerusalem and said, hi, we're Rome. We just arrived. Um, and so therefore, we're encouraging you to repent, to change your direction in life. No. What did they do? They came in with force. They came in with strength. They came in and imposed their rule. But when it comes to this kingdom of which Christ speaks, what we see right now, what we see in our day, what we saw when Christ came to earth, when the gospel was first being proclaimed, we see that there is an invitation. And I want to challenge each one of you that as I discuss being wired for the kingdom, and ultimately how to surrender to this king, 
how ultimately where salvation is found, and that's in the finished work of Jesus Christ, and we'll get there. I want you to see that right now there is an invitation for each one of your lives. But let me make this clear. Just because there's an invitation right now, one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I want you to know that it's not an invitation forever. There's one day when that king, it says the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our God, as we see when the book of Revelation um, chapter 11 comes to fruition. So with that being said, I want to discuss being wired for the kingdom. Now, as we start this topic, uh, I, I first just want to make one thing very clear. Christ is not calling us to a life which is, um, let's say, the lesser choice. In fact, enjoying intimacy with God, enjoying the life you were created to enjoy, the mission that he has you on. No, it's not a mission and a life of ease and comfort and, and, and your, your will but it's ultimately what you were created for. And I want to start off with just a, a quote from C.S. Lewis, and many of you may have heard it before. He said, Indeed, if we consider the unblushing promises of reward and the staggering nature of the rewards promised in the Gospels, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. We're like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. We are far too easily pleased. So when Christ came to earth in Luke 4.43, he tells us that I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. So let's discuss this kingdom of God. Now, again, I'm not going to go much into detail about uh, this topic as I want to discuss being wired for the kingdom, which is our topic, but let's get something straight. The kingdom of God exists currently, and yet it's also something which is to come. Now you might say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, I want you to think about a kingdom. What does a kingdom require? Well, a kingdom requires a king. We have a king. We have King Jesus. But a kingdom also requires subjects. It requires those who are submitted or surrendered or citizens of that kingdom. We also could say that a kingdom has laws. Um, we could say a kingdom has a territory. We could say many different things. But what I want you to understand is our issue is that we look for God's kingdom in the wrong place. And this is going to come out very clearly because even uh, if we looked at Romans 14 and we came down to verse 17, it says the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and of drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. We're going to see that Jesus says in Matthew 10, 34, I didn't come to bring peace on earth, but a sword. In other words, this is, please don't get in your mind this theology that we hear today. We're bringing his kingdom to this world. Well, hang on. We do want his reign in our life. And that's what we're going to discuss today. His reign uh, in our life, in our families, in our home. Absolutely. But this is not about that in 2021, God's kingdom comes to this world per se. But rather what we're going to see is there is a battlefield. There is a terrain where this, this rain is under attack. And what we're going to see is it's not so much in the world around us as it is in the life within us. And we're going to see this very clearly in Romans chapter 6. So I invite you to turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 6. It's where we're going to be hanging out and we're going to be discussing uh, the implications of having a life which is wired for the kingdom. Now, you understand this idea of conflict. And when I say conflict, let me start with a light example. Maybe some of you are sports fans. Perhaps you like football. If you like football, 
Well, uh, you know, the big teams in the world, teams like, well, Barcelona, or we could say Real Madrid, of course, is changing a bit, maybe Juventus, uh, maybe Manchester United, maybe it's Chelsea, maybe it's Man City, I don't know. But here's the thing. If you meet somebody that says, I like Chelsea, and then they say in the very next breath, I also like Manchester United, you say, you don't like football. Why? Because you don't root for Manchester United and for Chelsea. If you meet somebody that says, I like Real Madrid, and then the next breath they say, and I also like FC Barcelona, you say, you know nothing about Spanish football. You can't like both teams. How about in cricket? What if I said, I am the biggest India fan in the world. <laughs> and then I say, and my second favorite team is Pakistan. You say, you don't like cricket. You don't like Indian cricket for sure, because they're our biggest rivals. They're your least favorite team. <laughs> well, that goes without saying, we all understand that. But what I want you to also understand is there are kingdoms in conflict. This reign of Christ, this kingdom of God, this kingdom of heaven, and the kingdom of the world, we're going to see that they are polar opposites. We're going to see that they are kingdoms in conflict. And what is scary is as we discuss this, many of you, and when I say many of you, myself, I will see areas in my life where my life is not making sense, if I can say it like that, where, where, where I'm succumbing or I'm surrendering, or maybe it's just subtly there's aspects where I'm living for the kingdom of the world, where I'm being more wired by the world than wired by the word. And so I want to challenge you, listen closely and allow the Holy Spirit to convict your life as we walk through Romans 6 verses 12 through 14. And we look at seven aspects, seven aspects that ultimately uh, we need to process as we are desiring to be wired for the kingdom. Now, I think it'll all become clear as we go through the word of God. Let's begin in Romans chapter 6, verse 12. Paul is writing to the church at Rome and he says, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness, for sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. I'd like to pray again. Father, I ask your blessing on this time. I pray that everything would point us to the Lord Jesus, that our focus would be only on him. And Lord, if I say anything that's not being guided by you, please wipe it from our minds. But whatever is of you, embed it on our hearts. And God, I also ask that even if I don't say what needs to be heard by someone, that you would just speak to them because obviously nothing good happens without you ministering to our lives. And so, Lord, we're only looking to you. And Father, I pray that when this time finishes, that only Christ would get the glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So the first thing, if you're taking notes, and I do hope you're taking notes, but the first thing I'd like for you to write down is this, that there is a throne at stake. There is a throne at stake. Now we see this very clearly in verse 12. Let not sin, therefore reign, reign. Now notice a reign, a throne is being contested because again, there are these kingdoms, if I can say, in conflict. There is a throne which is being disputed in a life here. And this is what Paul is addressing. Let not sin, therefore reign. The word reign is actually the verb form of the word king. So we see very much this is about a king. But I want you to notice there is a decision involved, and this is important. Please understand in all of your lives, there is a decision involved when it comes to the throne of your life. Sin is a power. It's not just an act. We might just think, yeah, I sinned or I've sinned. 
But no, sin is actually also a power. It's a power at work. Now, obviously, we, we could define that more specifically, that there is a God of this age who we will discuss briefly a little later on. Um, and, and there are principalities and powers, but ultimately understand that, that this is not just about us acting wrong. There's actually a foe opposing us. Let, let me ask you a couple questions about your decisions in life. One is, what feelings factor into your decisions? Um, it, it does comfort factor in? Does uh, applause of man factor in? Does approval from family factor in? You see, there's this throne, but sometimes what's on our throne is very subtly something which is other than God, but we wouldn't say it's bad. It, it might be your family is on the throne of your life. It might just be uh, money is on the throne of your life. And I say just, uh, these things destroy. So it's not just. It, it, might, be, um, it, it might be something like busyness. <laughs> the point is, it doesn't have to be something which is innately sin. But let me remind you, anything but the Lord God, anything but his word on the throne of our life is ultimately that which is not God. It's called idolatry. And I want you to see that when he says, let not sin therefore reign, what is sin? Sin is missing the mark. It's missing the mark of God's holiness, God's perfection. Remember Matthew 5, be perfect even as your father in heaven is perfect. No, no, you might be saying you're preaching perfection. Just hold on, hold on. We're going to get through all this. Um, but for right now, what I want you to see is there's a throne at stake. And you think the enemy of your soul really cares what's on the throne as long as it's not the holy God? He doesn't. And that's what we're going to see is subtly other things take the throne of our life. Uh, what fears are factoring into your decision? What expectations are controlling your decision? Let me ask you a question. Are you aware that you're in a war? If you're going to be wired for the kingdom, you have to be aware that you're actually in a battle. You're in a war. Now, the beautiful thing is if you belong to Jesus Christ, you are not fighting for victory. You're fighting from victory. Big difference. If you're fighting for victory, it means that the battle has not been decided per se. It means that, that there's, there's no victory that's been won, my friends. In Jesus Christ, if your faith is in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary and his resurrection, what did he say? It is finished. Done is the work that saves once and forever done. Christ has conquered. So if you belong to the Lord Jesus, if your faith is in him, if I can say like on the Passover day, his blood is applied to the doorpost of your home. Well, you're fighting from victory. But let me ask you, do you know that you're in a war? Well, what's this war? Well, this war is ultimately to the glory of God, whether you eat, whether you drink, whatever you do. And, and what we see is the enemy doesn't want glory going to God. That's why he's happy. He's happy if in this session you give glory to me. Do not do that. Do not do that. You're a thief of God's glory. You're robbing him, and I'm in the process of robbing him. All glory goes to God. There's nothing good of us, nothing good, except the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us not fall into subtle traps of trying to please man or promote man or applaud man. Oh, man, this is dangerous. We're in a war. Everything is involved in this war. So let me ask you. If you're a soldier in a war, do you buy waterfront property on enemy territory? No. You don't make your investment there. Does, does, does a soldier wait to prepare for battle until he's there and, and, and the, the swords are clanging, the arrows are flying, the bombs are falling, and then he's like, oh, I guess I should go to training and prepare for war. No soldier does that. We know better, but why do we spiritually somehow think that, yeah, I'm in a battle, but I guess I can just kind of be like, you know, figuring things out as I go. Does a soldier wait until battle to get dressed? Do they get out there and start putting on their, on their armor, putting on their gear? No, they're prepared before they go. Does a soldier say, hey, you know what? There's no bombs falling right now. I'm going to get my chair and put my sunglasses on and just kind of lay in the sun for a little bit. No, we know this earthly speaking. There's a throne at stake. That's the first thing. The second thing, though, is this. There is a threat to scrutinize. There is a threat to scrutinize, to put under scrutiny. What is this threat? Verse 12, let not sin therefore reign 
in your mortal body. Now, what is this threat? Well, this threat is sin. It's a rebel. It's a rebel who wants to take over the kingdom. Now, when you say take over the kingdom, I understand fully. Christ reigns. I understand that there's salvation complete in him. But what does Paul say to the church at Ephesus? In chapter 4, you get down to verse 26. He says that we are not to give a place to the devil in our life. He's talking to Christians. What do you mean by a place? Well, it's easy that even as a believer, as Romans 6 is saying here, that even as a believer, we can open the door. And we're going to see this later on. We can open the door to temptation. We can open the door for sin. And we're going to see the solution to all of this a little later on. But there's a threat, and it's a threat we must scrutinize. You see, there's a God of this age, as 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 tells us, a prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in sons of disobedience, Ephesians 2, 2. But let me just quickly, and I'll say very quickly, don't believe the lies about this enemy that threatens our life, that wants to have access, that, that wants to distract us from what God's purpose is. You see, we have a myth of opposites. We think that somehow the devil is opposite of God. God has no opposite. God is holy. God is alone. The enemy is a created being. We can see that in, in, back in his story, how he was created and then rebelled. He's a created being. He's a constrained being. The devil has limits. Praise God for that. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Hey, he's also a condemned being. Have you read Revelation chapter 20? When you get um, to verse 10, we see that he's going to be thrown into the lake of fire. But with that too, I want you to see there's a myth of oversight. The devil's not even in charge of hell. Hell was created for his eternal damnation. So please don't give him more credit than, than he deserves, if I can say it like that. Uh, there's a myth of outcome. Sometimes we still feel like we're, we're like, who's going to win? I know when you look around you in this world, you might wonder who's going to win. Let me go and tell you, I've read the back of the book. I know who wins. I know who sits on the throne. It's the Lord God. It's Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. Or we could look at John 19, 30, like we mentioned. It's finished. Or Romans 8, 37. We're more than conquerors through him who loved us. See, if you know how something ends, why would you live for the opposite? In, in, in other words, if I was investing in a stock market and I know a stock is going to uh, triple tomorrow, well, why would I pull out of that stock or why would I not invest more if I know it's going to be successful? How much more spiritually speaking, we know who conquers. We know who has conquered and we know who will conquer. This is so beautiful and so clear. And yet as Christians, we seem to be more wired for the world than wired by the word. How is this? It's as though we don't believe the word of God. It's like we're doubting what it says, because if we did believe it, would we not realize that this threat that we're to scrutinize, this threat we're to recognize, is ultimately a threat that's trying to distract us from living for what actually counts for forever? We'll come back to that. And even the myth of opposition, let me remind you that as we think about the threat, please know this myth of opposition, our opposition is not mankind. Our opposition is not souls. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. We've got to keep this in mind. Now, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 26, it tells us, And they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. I want you to see something here. I want you to see it captured. This is what the enemy wants to do. He wants to capture. He wants to capture us. But let me encourage you, we know that escape is possible. It says after being captured that they can escape the snare of the devil. So I don't know where you are today. I don't know what you're struggling with today, but I just want to encourage you that wherever you are in your life, the Lord is ready to bring freedom. And that's where we want to go. So the third thing that we notice in this being wired for the kingdom is there is a terrain for the struggle. There's a battlefield. There's a terrain. What is that terrain? Verse 12, it says your mortal body, or it goes on to say your members. 
Now, I just read this verse from 2 Timothy 2.26. And if you remember back when we talked about spiritual dryness, we discussed the opposite between feelings and faith, feelings and faith. And what I want you to see is this terrain is our body. In other words, this is where the enemy is fighting this battle. Um, he wants to target our mind specifically. Um, he wants to target our mind. He wants to target our body. Romans 12, 1 tells us, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God to present what? Your bodies as a living sacrifice. We'll come back to that in a little bit. But let's take it a step further. It's vital to realize that someone or something is going to be taken captive. Now, why do I say that? Well, notice we already looked at 2 Timothy 2.26, that the enemy is seeking to capture, capture us um, to do his will. But notice in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, don't miss this. It tells us we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. Please get this. <laughs> Something is going to be taken captive in your life. Don't miss it. You might think nothing is being taken captive, but something is being taken captive. Either your mind is being taken captive by the ploys of the world, by the entertainment and amusement of the world, by the music of the world, by the ideas of the world, by the politics of the world, or your mind is going to be, or, or the things of the world are going to be captured to obedience in Christ, to obedience to Christ, as 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5 tells us. See, there's going to be captivity. You're in a war, and the question is, what's being taken captive? There's a terrain for this struggle, and that terrain is our body. It's our mind. This is where the battle is taking place. This is where that kingdom, if I can say, this reign is being disputed. Is Christ, is his word reigning in your life? If you're going to be wired for the kingdom, well, you've got to recognize that there's actually this conflict even taking place in the first, in the first place. First Corinthians 1031, as I've already quoted, says that we are, whether you eat, whether you drink, or whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. See, everything as we walk through life has the opportunity to glorify God or to not. And so I want to challenge you, be aware of this. Now, we got to keep moving on. We, we don't have long. Um, the fourth thing is this. There are tools to surrender. Well, what do we see in verse 13? Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness. This word instruments, um, the other four times it's used in scripture, three times by Paul and then once by John, it's translated weapons or armor. So it says, don't present your members to sin as weapons for unrighteousness. There are tools. We have weapons. But what are these weapons? Well, again, these weapons have to do with our body. But I want you to notice in this verse, the weapons, it's a neutral word. Instruments, it's neutral. It can go positive. It can go negative. In other words, what God has given you can be used for his glory, and it can also be used for the enemy's tactics and ploys. Be aware. Even the word passions in this verse, it's neutral. It could be translated passions, lusts, evil desires. But notice, it, we're referring to the body, not to sin. In other words, it can go either way. What is it being surrendered to in your life? There's a great song by a woman named Frances Havergale. Maybe you've heard it before, but she says, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. And she goes on, take my feet, take my voice, take my lips, take my silver and my gold, take my intellect, take my will, take my heart, take my love, take myself. What's the point? Everything we have, our hands, our lips, our ears, our eyes, our mind, our feet, our body. You see, these are all tools in this castle that's under attack, if I can say it like that. These are tools that as followers of Jesus Christ, he says, surrender them to me. Let me use them for my glory. But my question is, do we recognize if we're going to be wired for the kingdom, we have to realize we have these weapons. We have this armor to use for God. But the enemy equally wants to use my mind and my weapons and, 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 and my mouth. So there are tools to surrender. 
Moving on, there are tactics. There are tactics to see. There are tactics to see. Now, when I say do, there are tactics to see, I want you to go to verse 13. It says, do not present your members as to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. Stop there. Now, see again, do not present your members. This word present is really two parts. We see it twice in this verse. And the, the first part, it, it means um, to place or, and the second part is beside. So the idea is like to put something beside, to put something alongside. I, I want you to understand this is what we're warned against doing. There are tactics of the enemy and the enemy wants us to place our life beside things that will destroy, to place our life beside things that will distract us from the pursuit of knowing God, from the mission that God has us on. What is that mission that God has us on? to know him and to make him known, to make disciples of all nations. Wow, he's got us on a mission which has eternal impact. So what does the enemy want? He wants to place us alongside a career where we'll focus more on our career than on the mission of God. He wants to place us alongside relationships where we focus more on the relationships than on what God has for us. You see, do not present. Don't put yourself next to. Don't put yourself in a place of danger where you risk living a wasted life. There are tactics of the enemy, and this is one of his tactics. Now, if I had more time, I would go through a lot of his tactics, how he uses deceit, how he uses counterfeit actions, slander, discouragement, uh, pride, moral failure, false doctrine, dis, uh, bodily affliction, procrastination, all kinds of things to keep us from recognizing what the king of our life, Jesus Christ, wants from us. But let's keep going because we're going to wrap it all up and then we'll bring it together. Uh, the next thing I want you to see, number six, is that there is a treasure to sacrifice. There's a treasure to sacrifice. That same word present in verse 13, it's important. Why? Well, this treasure to sacrifice is our own life. You say, is that really a treasure? Well, it is in a sense. Why, why do I say that? Well, when Jesus Christ speaks in, in uh, Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21, he says, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Why, why is he saying that? Well, because we can lay up for ourselves treasures on earth. It's not that these aren't treasures. It's that they're not treasures worth living for. In other words, he's given us our life to do what? We've been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God with your body, which is the Lord's. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and you can read verses 19 and 20. What I want to encourage you is in this journey of being wired for the kingdom, there's a sacrifice that has to take place, and that sacrifice is to present our bodies. That same word, by the way, present. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice. And who are we presenting them to? To the Lord, to the one who purchased us with his blood, who redeemed us, who's worthy of it. And so what I want you to see here is that there is a treasure to sacrifice, to present to the Lord. One final thing, and then I'm going to bring it all together. The final thing in this passage is I want you to see that there is a treaty to sign, a treaty to sign. Now, when I say a treaty to sign, I don't literally mean that you're signing a treaty. But what I want you to see is I want you to see the terms of this relationship with God. You might say, well, the terms are I have to be obedient, but you're wrong. That's not how the relationship is established. We actually see in verse 14, it says, for sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. Under grace. That is what we are under in Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to notice when he says we're under grace, this is so important. When we come to Jesus Christ, we come to him because we recognize who he is. We recognize what he has done for us. And we also know what he has promised us. Those who come to me, I give them eternal life. No man can snatch them out of my hand. If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we will be saved, eternally saved. He promises, just like the blood on the doorpost in the Passover back in Exodus 12, if the blood was there, the angel of death passed over. It didn't matter how confident the families were inside that house. What mattered is 
Did they apply the blood? Was the blood on the doorposts of their home? See, I bet a lot of you have, some of you are, 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 are doubting certain things, you're struggling with certain things, but it comes back to one thing. And the thing is this, have you placed your faith in the grace of Jesus Christ that he loves you, that he gave his life for you, that he conquered death for you? And by believing, you will have life in his name. This is what he offers. But but as this chapter starts out, are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? I want to challenge you. When I say there's a treaty to sign, I want to challenge you. It's like this blank sheet of paper. You see, when we come to God, we don't come with terms and conditions that he has to agree to. We don't come saying, God, I'm going to give you part of my life. Jesus doesn't want to be part of your life. He wants everything from beginning to end. He wants control of your money, your relationships, your career, your thoughts, your mission, everything about you. Why? Because he purchased you with his blood. We come to him knowing that he loves us more than we love ourselves. We just sign our name at the bottom and say, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. There's a song that says, King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be. Lest I forget the thorn crowned brow, lead me to Calvary. See, what I want you to see is it, to be wired for the kingdom is to ultimately recognize that there is a king who so loves you, a king that has conquered and that will forever sit on the throne. And what you've got to decide now is, am I going to surrender my life to this king? Am I going to decide that it's not about what I feel? It's not about what I prefer. It's not about how confident I am in a certain decision, but rather I recognize that I am no longer my own. I have been bought with a price and my, my joy, my mission is now to live for the one who loved me and gave himself for me, as Galatians 2.20 tells us. And so this is where we're going to start to wrap things up here, because what is the response for each one of us? Well, the response is very clear. It's what Jesus always said when he talked about the kingdom, when he talked about his reign, when he talked about surrendering to this one who loves you more than you love yourself. And what's the word? The word is repentance. Repentance. It's a military term. It, it means to turn 180 degrees. It means to face the opposite direction. Repentance. Yes, we are to repent of our sin. Absolutely. And first, to be saved. If, you're, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, my friends, he doesn't want to amend your life. He doesn't want to reform your life. He, he's here to transform your life. He's here to make you new, not make you better. He's not here to, 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 to simply adjust things or rearrange things. He's here for a new creation. So the first thing is to repent that you need a savior, that you can't save yourself. If you've never done that, give your life to Jesus Christ today. He's willing to save you regardless of what your past looks like, because it's not about your past. It's about his finished work. It's about his character and who he is and what he's done and what he promises. So if that's you, but what if you belong to Jesus? If you belong to Jesus, I want to ask you, are you in your life refusing to surrender the throne? You can ask questions about this, and I'm happy to say more. But I want to ask you, where are you refusing to surrender that reign where you know the word of God says something? When, when he says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. Well, how often do I still lay up for myself treasures on earth? That's blatant disobedience to the word of God. What about do not worry about tomorrow? He says three times, do not worry, do not worry, do not worry in one passage. And yet, how often do we accept worry as just a subtle place in our life? Well, what are we doing? We're giving the throne of our life to the cares of this world. Over and over, I can give you examples, but repentance. Repentance is to say, God, you are right. I am wrong, and I surrender to your way. I'm going to walk in obedience even if I'm struggling with where it might lead or what it might look like, because I believe that you who see the end from the beginning love me more than I love myself, you are the one that, that created me for a purpose, and I'm going to surrender to that throne in my life. Let me just close with a little story. Uh, there was a guy named Luigi Torresio, 
Now, you probably have never heard of him, and that's totally okay. I hadn't either for a while. But he was found dead one morning in his house without, without really much comfort at all in the place. I mean, it's a very simple place. But in his house, he had 246 exquisite violins that he had been collecting his whole life, and he had crammed them into his attic. Now, the interesting thing is these violins were some of the most treasured violins in the world but nobody had ever heard their song. Nobody had ever heard the music that, that would have come from such a beautiful violin. They were just stashed away. You know, as we think about that, here's a guy that said he loved violins, and so he collected violins, but these violins never made music. These violins never were used for the purpose for which they were supposed to be used. You see, so often, Christians are like Luigi. We're like him where we are hoarding what God has given us. We're keeping it for ourselves. We're stashing away in the attic. But when I think about wired for the kingdom, what's going to happen? When we're surrendered to the king, we're going to start to see love pouring out of our lives because, again, we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. We're going to start to see people around us touched with his character. We're going to start to see that joy being shown to a world where there's so much hopelessness. We're going to start to see peace in situations where there's conflict because we're not putting it in political futures, but we're putting it in a God who holds the future. See, it's amazing that I heard a stat, 95% of all Christians have never led anybody to Jesus Christ. Well, I'm not saying that to make anyone feel bad, but my point is, when we're not surrendered, when we're not wired for the kingdom, we're going to be living for the world. We're going to be focused on things of the world. We're not going to be focused on the Lord Jesus Christ, what he's done, and then what he wants to do with you. So in the question and answer session, I want to encourage you, ask questions that have to do with the practical play out. I've kind of intentionally not said too much because we have 40 more minutes to talk about practically what does this look like in your life and in my life. But to know this for sure, to be wired for the kingdom means that you are surrendered to the king, that you recognize there is a battle going on, that you recognize where the battle's taking place, your mind, your body, and also recognize the strategy, and that is to place ourselves alongside the word of God, not alongside the ways of this world. And as we do that, my friends, what God's going to do is step by step, action by action, moment by moment, he's going to start, he's going to start showing forth his reign in your life and through your life to a world that desperately needs to see the characteristics of our king. I'll stop there, so we'll close in prayer a little later on, but I'll pass it off to my brother, Ronnie, who's gonna start this question and answer session. If anything was unclear, please ask about that too. You're not gonna offend me. I'm a simple man seeking to present in 40 minutes a, a very deep subject. And so I know I have said some things that were not clear or confusing. Don't feel bad telling me that. We can discuss it further. Thank you, thank you, Nate, uh, for the sermon. Um, and it was it was a reminder. And yes, what you said is uh, right. We are not wired, but uh, we fail ourselves. And uh, let Lord enable us to recapture that all that uh, God has from the time of salvation until now. Just a reminder that uh, we have the question and answer session, and you can still post your questions. Another 40 minutes more, uh, you can post your questions to uh, Ronnie Abraham, or you can have uh, the pigeonhole link. Uh, you have it in the chat boxes, or you can go ahead and uh, post your questions there. Over to you, Ronnie. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Justice, and thank you, Brother Nate, for uh, that wonderful message. Um, it's been a while since I've seen you. Uh, so there are a lot of questions. Mm, but fortunately, it's from the audience today. We have uh, we have figured out like we have taken some questions uh, right now. Uh, so the first question: 
what then does it mean when we say in the Lord's Prayer, uh, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, if it is not actually meaning on this earth. So this has to do with your the first comment about, you know, a lot of people talking about the kingdom coming into um, the world. I'm sorry, I temporarily got cut off. Okay, uh, I can repeat that question, no problem. Uh, Benoit, if you could share the screen. Yeah, Benjamin, thank you. So this is pertaining to the first statement that you made about uh, the theology these days about kingdom coming into this world, this earth. So what then does it mean when we say in the Lord's Prayer, let your kingdom come, it will be done on earth as it is in heaven, if it's not actually meaning on this earth? Great. Excellent question. Thank you for asking that. Okay. So just a couple things. I'll be, I'll be simple on the answer. So that's just so we can get to other ones. But um, if it's not clear, feel free to even write me afterwards and we can discuss it way more. But um, a couple things. One, I, I briefly mentioned Romans 14. So go there for a second, Romans 14. And what we see is we do see, yes, it is on earth, but there's a difference. The Let's read verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And then when Jesus is saying in Matthew 6 that we're to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I pray every day for my little girl, for my daughter. And my prayer for her is that God's kingdom would come and that his will would be done in her life as it is in heaven. Now, what are we praying here? Well, his kingdom, his reign does is on earth, but through whom? Through his body, through the church. In other words, his reign is being shown through our life. So yes, very much his righteousness, his peace, his hope, his joy, absolutely. But if I had had more time um, and took another half hour, I would have taken you to the gospel of John and the gospel of Matthew. We would have looked at Peter. And what we would have seen is when Jesus is um, before Pilate, what does he say? Go over to um, John chapter 18. John 18. He says in verse 36, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. So what's happening? Why are we praying his kingdom come? Well, when you pray his kingdom come, let me say two things. You're, here's what you're praying for. So be careful. The first thing you're praying for is you're praying for the Lord Jesus's return. You're praying for Christ to come back. You absolutely are. Why? Because as we see Revelation 11, that uh, I'll just read it to you so you can, I want you to know things are the word of God and not uh, Nate Bramson suggesting something because that would just uh, be useless. Verse 15, Revelation 11 says, the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. That's the end result. But wait, go to Matthew chapter four. Go to Matthew chapter four. What does the devil try to do before the cross? The devil takes him up on the pinnacle of the temple. Um, and then, then after that, he takes him to another temptation and he takes him to a very high mountain in verse eight, shows him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he says, all these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Jesus could have had the kingdoms before the cross, right? Wait, that's not the way that to redeem our souls, to pay for our sin, to take the wrath of God. See, he loves us. And so when we pray your kingdom come, your will be done. Well, the kings of the world will be his, but Revelation 11 but for right now, where is that kingdom? Romans 14, 17. It's in us. He shows his reign through us. So when I pray, your kingdom come, your will be done, I'm praying for the Lord's return. And I'm praying for full surrender in my own life. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Nate. Um, pretty uh, straightforward. And thank you for taking uh, this from the scriptures as well, the response that you gave. Uh, so to everybody out there, um, if you want to ask questions directly, that is, you know, on call, uh, do raise your hands. The host will help you out. And, you know, maybe you can unmute yourself and ask your question directly to Nate. Else we'll continue with the questions that are there on the list right now. So the next question is, our life is a worship to the Lord. I think this could be 
from based on Purpose Driven Life, the book. Um, hence, should we never praise or appreciate anybody? Our life is a worship to the Lord. Hence, should we never praise or appreciate anybody? I appreciate the heart by which this was asked. So I wanted to say whoever asked it, you're actually asking this question. Um, I want to lead you to Isaiah 42, verse 8. Isaiah 42, 8. Um, here it says, I am the Lord. That is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to carved idols. So a couple categories. No other, carved idols. All right, just pause there for a second. This is one verse, but it's also a uh, uh, capturing of all the scriptures, if I can say it like this, everything points to the Lord Jesus. And, and even as Dan prayed at the very beginning that we would be focused on Jesus Christ. Well, why? Because anything good in us is going to come back to the Lord Jesus. Anything of merit, when I stand before God one day, yes, he's allowed things to be done through each one of our life. But if, if you knew everything about my life, you would say, man, you are a messed up individual. You're broken sinful and say yeah and you don't even know half of it the reality is that but for the grace of god and this is the beauty though he takes these creatures like me and he makes us new and then he molds us and molds us and molds us this is a work of his wonder so we can appreciate i absolutely would say appreciate we can see that in the epistles when um when paul is articulating his appreciation for the saints if you're wondering where i'm not going to take time but you could read romans 16 as an example but basically read the beginning and end of any epistle or a lot of epistles and you'll see that appreciation for the saints being it appreciate that's fabulous but at the end of the day at the end of the moment let us realize that anything praiseworthy it's ultimately because of the Holy Spirit. It's ultimately because of the grace of God. Because but for the grace of God, we would all be destroyed. We wouldn't even be here. So obviously, everything is a product of his grace. So that's why I say what I say. And I do believe that we become feasts of his glory. Also, I just want to encourage you one other, I won't go into this, but one small thing. Whenever we put a, a woman or a man on a pedestal, all we're doing is giving them a place to fall from. And that's why we have a lot of disillusionment in the Christian world today, because we put people on pedestals and then they fail. And let me just tell you, it's not that we can't appreciate the good that comes from people's lives, but ultimately, when our foundation and our praise is of Jesus Christ, he will never fail you. I'll stop there. Amen. Amen to that, uh, Nate. Uh, and it was really encouraging also to watch the video about you talking about Christians when we put somebody on the pedestal. So um, that, that is really encouraging. So uh, probably appreciating is fine, but praising uh, all praise be to God, right? So uh, the next question, uh, the next question, what happens to people who pretend to live for the kingdom of God or considers and are confident of their acts, which are more traditional and worldly? I'll repeat the question. What happens to people who pretend to live for the kingdom of God or considers and are confident of their acts, which are more traditional and worldly? I'm not positive. I understand the direction of this question fully. So I'm going to just say my answer might not be what's being asked. Okay. Um, and Ronnie, maybe you can help guide me if I'm if you do understand it perfectly. But I would say that we have to always come back to the word of God. What we cannot do when it comes to Christ's reign in our life is look at a cultural standard. And, and okay, let's go back to that prayer that we prayed at the beginning to fix our eyes on Jesus. Now think about this. Anytime our focus is on a church, is on a system is on a, a, a man is on um, let's say comparing ourselves to the world around us worldliness we're not fixed on Christ because our eyes God's created so we're not focused on two things at once uh, I say this because I oftentimes see that people are very confident in the way that they're living but the reason they're confident is they're different from the world not because they're conforming to Christ not because they're pursuing Christ if that makes sense so what do we learn in Colossians 3, 
one and two specifically that we because we've been raised with christ set your mind on things above seek the things which are above where christ is seated and so what are we doing we're setting our mind we're seeking things above and, and the, the reason this is so important is when that is our pursuit what's going to ultimately happen god's going to be changing our life he's going to be conforming our life and what are we called in the word of God? Well, Matthew 5, 14 to 16 would be an example. Um, but also we can see in 1 Thessalonians 4, we can see in 1 John chapter 1, that we are people of light. We are the light of the world. Well, how does that light shine brightly? Um, even as like Philippians 2, um, 2, 14, 15 say, um, that we're to walk blameless, right? In this darkness um, as, as children of light. I want to suggest to you that that light shines brighter as we are conformed to the image of Christ. So I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but what I want to encourage you with is my job is not to go around and analyze those that aren't, um, but my responsibility is to daily surrender and repent of those places in my life where I'm looking at other things, I'm comparing myself to other things, and ultimately I'm not allowing the Holy Spirit to conform me more and more into the image of Christ. So I don't know if I answered your question, but I just want to encourage you that, yeah, we can live worldly, but when we're living worldly, it's because we're looking at things other than Christ. And therefore we've succumbed to being comfortable in a place that ultimately is sin. Right. Uh, Nate, if I could add to that question once again, like let's say, uh, so the question, the first part of the question was what happens to people who pretend to live for the kingdom of God? Um, can you just um, look at the recent scandals that have been coming in? About sure. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so first of all, let me let me make this really really clear at, at the onset that you and I are not the ones who have to analyze all day what the result is. We need to, we should look in the sense, and we should be aware. We should always come back to our own life and ask, okay. Am I seeing any hints of this in me? Am I, um, and do I have areas of darkness? Do I have that which I'm hiding? But what happens to them? Well, here's the thing. I'm not the one they're going to stand before. And I don't know the, I don't know whether or not a certain someone or another someone um, believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, because if they truly placed their faith in him, I absolutely believe that he saved them. I also know that it is possible for a follower of Christ to get drastically sidetracked from the gospel, to get lured in by sin. Now, again, those who practice such things, um, I know that in my life there have been many times, and I'm, I, I, I'm like shocked to even say that, um, but many times that I allowed sin to not only be there, but to, to practice it. And then I read what it says in Galatians 5, like, how can we practice these things? But it's subtle as it enters. And what is that result? The result is repentance. So here's my encouragement for you. I don't know where other people stand, but I'll tell you before the Lord um, and with, with any sin that he's shown me in my life, the, the response was I had to come and repent before him. It says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourselves to see if you are in the faith. That's what I encourage you with. Don't worry about every other person and where they are. You. Do you know that Jesus Christ is in you? Do you know that you've come to him and repented of your sin, turned from your evil way, given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ who purchased you? Again, you might have a crazy past. You might have stories that you wish nobody would ever know. But the reality is that God knows you and he still wants you to be his. And that's why Christ's blood and sacrifice is greater than anything you've ever done. But the question is this, are you willing to humbly repent? And remember, repentance is to turn and he will save you. So maybe I'm not going to focus on others. Now, if you want more on that topic, I think Ronnie alluded to it. I actually just did a, like a 17 minute video on my Facebook you can go watch it and it really addresses that. And there are three aspects it addresses. I won't go to that right now. Um, and so, yeah, go check that out. But for you today, let's focus on our heart and ask, are we actively repenting and responding to the Holy Spirit's work? 
Thank you. Thank you, Nate. Um, I'll move to the next question. What, what would be the response to people who think that just giving some money for God's work is their only calling? Uh, usually people aren't giving sacrificially, but just so that they don't feel guilty. I'll read the question again. What would be the response to people who think that just giving money for God's work is their only calling? Usually such people aren't giving sacrificially, but just so that they don't feel guilty. Mm. That's an interesting question. And I, I appreciate that you brought up one specific example of it, and that's to be giving sacrificially with our money or giving. But I'll, I'll reiterate what I said earlier. Jesus doesn't want to be part of your life. He wants everything. And so when I say he wants everything, well, what am I pointing to in the Gospels? Um, remember when Jesus is calling his disciples after that whole incident with Peter um, saying he won't, he shouldn't go to the cross and all. Jesus says in Matthew 16, 24, he says, if any man desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. And then he goes on, whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what is the profit of man if he gains the whole world, but he loses his soul. What, what I challenge you with is this. Now, when I say giving everything, it doesn't mean 100% of your money. You're just like, oh, I'll get rid of it. Uh, like the point is everything we have is the Lord's. Our time is the Lord's. Our career is the Lord's. Our, our money is the Lord's. Our relationship is the Lord's. Our words are the Lord's. And if we view it as any less than that, then what we're really viewing is not a, not a king. <laughs> we're viewing him as a, a, maybe a boss in one area. We're viewing him as a good teacher. But let me encourage you, when Jesus Christ is only over certain areas of your life, you are on the throne of your life. Why? Because you're deciding what parts he gets and what parts he doesn't. You're deciding to what limits. And that's what I challenge you with. Yes, it's wonderful that there's one area of your life where it's being demonstrated that Christ has value. But ultimately, I want you to see that when we look at the word of God, there's nothing in there that points towards Jesus being solely um, having ownership of, of parts of us. We can be like Martha in Luke chapter 10, right? Where she says, Lord, do you not care that Mary has left me to serve alone? Tell her to help me. She calls him Lord and then tells him what to do. How often we call Jesus Lord and then we're basically commanding him and placing him into compartments of our life. So, and, and please let me just make this clear. When I say he should have your career, he should have your family, he should have, that doesn't mean you're in so-called full-time ministry. It means that whatever you do, eat, drink, whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. It means you don't compromise in your place of work. It means you use the opportunities for the gospel, even if you might lose your job. It means you give, even if you have to change your way of life. It, it, it means that in everything, Christ has preeminence. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Nate. Um, we'll go to the next question. Uh, it is how to encourage people to live with the kingdom perspective in mind. This is what you pointed at the start. Could you give some example from your life where you lived with the kingdom perspective? And um, the next part of that is, you know, control over our body or members is easier said than done. Hormones are natural. Can you give some practical advice or suggestions? Um, so these are like, let's take this as two questions. So uh, could you give examples, uh, not, not for your not to personally praise or appreciate you, but for the glory of God. Yeah, I mean, I, I can I can give you positives and I can give you negatives on this. Um, when I think about living with a kingdom perspective in mind, um, it, it's it's really almost uh, questions that I have to ask myself multiple times throughout the day. So, for instance, with the kingdom living with a kingdom perspective in mind right now, um, let's say purchases when I go to the store and uh, and maybe something that I'm like, you know, should we or shouldn't we buy it? This is a simple thing, right? But I have to ask the question of what eternal value does it have? Um, how can this be used for the kingdom of God? How is this used to further 
his reign in lives. Um, so a kingdom perspective happens when I'm at the shopping mall. Um, a kingdom perspective happens when I'm, um, let's say, at fellowship time with at my local church. And when we're just talking, well, what do I have to ask? I have to start to ask, um, is this conversation building up or is this conversation tearing down? Am I encouraging or am I discouraging? Are we, do we have any form of gossip or slander in here? Like what's going, so again, kingdom perspective impacts that. Kingdom perspective obviously impacts um, intentionality in the way that we use our time. So let's think about, let's just think about how we, how uh, like in life, I've noticed it been multiple times in my life where um, I've had, hobbies hobbies are not bad by the way you can use those for the glory of god and 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 use it to build relationships but um i remember uh as a younger guy i used to um enjoy certain sports games on game systems and it was just completely a waste of time it was completely just uh something which amounted to nothing except pure entertainment that that resulted in a waste of that part of my life and, and i just want to challenge you like when you have a kingdom perspective you're going to take your moments and you're going to start to ask this question of wait what value does this have in relation to the end of the story when the kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdoms of our god and of his son like what how, how does how is this playing into that how is this amounting to that final day? The other thing I encourage you is this, begin with the end in mind in everything you do. Begin with the end in mind. And what's that end? Second Corinthians chapter five, we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give account of the works done in the body, whether good or worthless. Begin with that end in mind. And then as you walk through your day, try it, try it even tonight. As you go to bed, think about, you know, maybe, maybe uh, you read a book, maybe you're on your phone, maybe you're doing nothing, maybe you're praying, but just ask, how am I using my time wisely? How am I using my relationships wisely when I think about where I want to be when I stand before the Lord Jesus Christ on this particular thing? And I find that makes a big difference. Now, that whole hormone side, the second part of the question, Ronnie, um, I really like the fact you asked that because the Lord knows that we are flesh. He knows that we're frail. He knows we're weak. So there's a key phrase we saw in Romans chapter six, do not present don't place your life alongside these things. Now, it doesn't mean you're not in the world. You're just not of the world. But when I say don't place your life alongside, I find that the most difficult time to resist temptation is when I'm actually planting myself in places of temptation. See, thoughts will still come to my mind. I'll still pass billboards that distract and, and, and want to challenge me to lust. I'll still have words that come in and challenge me to be upset or have a bad attitude or, or anger. I'll still have all of those opportunities. But when I'm not placing myself alongside, when I'm placing myself alongside the word instead of the things of the world, when I'm placing myself alongside brothers and sisters who can walk with me in life, well, yes, hormones are still there, but the reality is I'm not giving opportunity to the enemy to take root, if I can say it like that, and really let those things um, develop. If you read James chapter one, you see that temptation actually has a process. It's not just a one step and bam, you're falling to sin. It's a door through which you enter and it's a slippery slope by which you slide. So I hope that's helpful. Um, but again, that's a topic we could discuss for an entire hour. Right. Um, I just got a question uh, so linked to that. So I don't know if that'll be presented, but I'll just try. Um, so this, this is the question. What do, what do I do when I feel defeated? Um, no, no. Yes, what do I do when I feel defeated by repetitive sin? do not know how to seize the victory that Christ offers over sin. Mm. Um. Wow. I, I actually just did an entire conference on this topic called Living in the Victory of Calvary. And um, I don't know who asked the question, but if that person wants to write me personally, I will send you a link to um, that entire conference because there's so much I want to say on this. Let me just speak to this person. Anybody can listen in, but let me just speak to them. I, I know where you're at. 
and I know how you feel. Um, it's one thing to, to sin as a unbeliever and then meet your savior. It's another thing to know the savior and to live with repetitive sin. And I have walked through times in my life where that was the case. And I can just say, praise be to God that he rescued me and the freedom you enjoy when in repentance is beautiful. So I want to challenge you on the other side. There is so much hope and there's beauty, but here's the thing with this. Um, we have to first recognize what the salvation of our God actually is. You see, it's it's not about us trying harder. It's actually about us surrendering all the more. Now, I'll clarify. In Galatians chapter 3, verse 3, Paul is writing to the church in Galatia. And he says, Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Think about this. How were you saved? Well, you all would say a similar thing. You would say, I was saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, the one who died for me and loved me, gave himself for me, and then he conquered death. I placed my faith in him. Something like that. But then if I ask you, how are you being sanctified? You might say, well, I heard this really good message and you know, I'm applying this and this and this. I'm trying hard here and this and I'm, I'm right. No, but what did he say? Having begun in the spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? See, you were saved by grace. But actually, the journey of sanctification is also by grace. In fact, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 calls Jesus Christ our sanctification. He is my sanctification. When I stand before Christ one day, it's not because I worked really hard and was sanctified. It's because Christ is my sanctification. He's my salvation. He's my righteousness. He's my sanctification. He's my everything. I've got nothing except for Jesus Christ. But how do I live in that victory? Well, that victory ultimately is going to be a, a surrender not more methods, but a surrender to Christ. It's going to be saying, all right, but how does that surrender look? Here's the key. The key is not about avoiding evil. You try to avoid evil, you know what you're going to happen? You're going to avoid that evil and you'll fall into another one. The key is a pursuit of Christ. The key is a pursuit of what he's called you to, what he's called you to be. In other words, as you're pursuing his mission for you, as you're pursuing his will for you, and the things of this world grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. I want to challenge every one of you. You've been called. If you're in Christ, you've been called on mission. Deny yourself, take up your cross, and what? Follow me. That's why it's vital that in this scene, this wired for the kingdom, it's every part of your life. Because if it's not every part of your life, you know what happens? You have those little nuggets, those places of darkness where you resort to, where you hide your sin and where you allow sin to reside and, and, and ruminate in your life. So that's why I challenge you. It's a pursuit. Living in the victory of Calvary is ultimately going to be this surrendering journey of pursuing, of knowing Christ more and more. Um, I just want to say this as a side note. Um, and it's free, so I'm not trying to sell you anything. Um, this book, Prosper, Enjoying Intimacy with God, is a 31-day journey. I wrote it during radiation treatment for cancer, and uh, it's all based off of Psalm 1, verses 2 and 3, which I love because I think the name, um, Streams of Water, even come from that. And so every chapter ends with seven very open-ended questions and addresses sin in our life. It addresses this journey of, of enjoying a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, but it really is this journey. And so if you want the free download of that, you can go to our website, rockintl.org, um, and there's a free download there for that book. So just letting you know if that would be encouraging. Also, I can send you the audio to the whole um, sermon series, Living in the Victory of Calvary. But um, just keep in mind that this is not going to be about you trying harder. It's ultimately about resting in, surrendering to, and living for the one who died and gave himself for you. Thank you, Nate. Um, I have one last question and then uh, one clarification, something you said before. So first I'll go to the question. Um, completely, so this is definitely written by somebody uh, and it definitely hit my heart. So I was just wondering, completely trusting God with my life. I took the path he asked me to, though I didn't want to, only to be left stranded at a dead end. Surrendering again is hard after this betrayal and depression. It's just a comment. Um, so I'll read that again, or Nate, if you could just go ahead and uh, yeah, I'd like, I'd like to I, I really appreciate that this was shared because this is shared from a hurting heart. But I want to ask you, did God lie to you? 
because he tells us that when we follow him, what's going to happen? Death to a lot of things. I no longer live. So expect it to be hard. What does he promise us in Matthew chapter 5 when you get down to verses 10 through 12? He says that people will revile and hate you and say all kinds of evil falsely against you on my account. You're going to be persecuted for righteousness sake. Now, why do I say that? Oftentimes we doubt God when he does exactly what he promised he would do. In other words, when things get hard, what do you say in John, uh, John 15? I have to verify my reference here. Um, John 15 verses 18 to 20 says, if they hated me, they'll hate you. Um, if they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. A servant is not greater than his master. Yes, that's correct. Um, these things are expected to happen. You feel like you're at a dead end, but let me ask you, is it really a dead end? Or could it be that the very things he's brought you through, the very thing you think is a dead end is actually the platform of opportunity to glorify his name? Could it be the difficulties of life are actually the blessings by which the world around will see God's goodness, even when it seems that he's failed you? And when the world thinks he's failed you, you actually are enjoying a deeper intimacy with him. Could it be you're rejecting the invitation he has for you to enjoy intimacy because you're bitter about him not meeting your expectations when he was still true to his word? Be encouraged. Our God is no one's debtor. And remember, you're not at a dead end. Why? Because it's not the end. It's not even near the end. Because if you belong to Jesus Christ, the last chapter is called Forever with the Lord. And there's an old song that says, it will be worth it all when we see Jesus. Life's trials will seem so small when we see him. One look on his dear face, all sorrows will erase. So gladly run the race till we see Christ. So you have to choose. Are you going to believe the word? Are you going to believe the way you feel about your situation? Thank you. Thank you, Nate, for that answer. Um, that was an answer for all of us. And I remember recently my, one of my mentors told me, uh, God has not promised you a good salary, a good job, a good married, happy life. Uh, he has promised you his Holy Spirit who will comfort you uh, through this life on earth. Uh, so just uh, one uh, last bit, uh, Nate, like there was this, just to give a clarification based on an answer you gave. So what did you mean when you said, don't focus on the church while answering one of the questions? I thought as believers, everything we did for church would help ourselves and the people in church grow. Um, I missed out on that bit, sorry, but do you remember, Nate, where? Yeah, uh, I do. Yeah. I remember what he was saying, um, because I was giving an illustration of um, when we don't focus on other believers, which is the church. Don't focus on the world. Don't fo We focus on the Lord Jesus. What I mean by that is this. We obviously, what you said is true. We want to be ministering among them. We want to love them. We want to, you could say, if you want to do linguistically, yeah, we should have a focus on the church in the sense of in our life. That's a major part that we're investing in. But when we're looking at obedience, don't base your obedience off of, I'm not going to base my obedience off of what Ronnie's doing and say, well, Ronnie's doing that. Therefore I can do it. Now, see, we both are looking at Christ. And as we both look at Christ, then we grow. See, when I'm discipling um, young men, I'm very, very clear to say, you're going to learn from good example, and you're going to learn from poor example. And when there's an example in my life that doesn't reflect Christ, I have to be very quick to say, I am so sorry, that did not look like Christ. What am I doing? I'm saying, I'm refocusing on the Lord. I'm saying that this is your example. The example is Christ. And so as we walk around, yeah, the examples we set might be flawed, but may we have that humility constantly. I'm not saying I always have it, but constantly to say that didn't reflect Christ. And so when I say don't focus on the church, what I mean is um, don't, don't make that what you want to exactly be like. No, we want to be like Christ. And then as we're seeking to be like Christ, well, great. That's going to be reflected to others around us. So just that clarifying. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, but yeah, don't focus on anyone else because when your focus is on anyone else, it's not on the Lord. Thank you, Nate. Uh, we do have a few other questions. We, I encourage all of you to keep putting those questions in uh, the pigeonhole 
or if you know any of us, you can ask us. You can ask Nate directly as well. Uh, if you know uh, his details, contact details, you can reach I'll out to him as well. I'll put some details in the chat too right now while you're talking. That'll be wonderful. That's wonderful, Nate. You can do that. So we'll try and address those questions at a later time, uh, but please do put your questions in there. Thank you for taking your time and answering the questions, and thank you to everybody who put up questions. Uh, over to you, uh, Justice. Thank you. Thank you, Nate, and uh, thank you, Ronnie. And uh, once again, it was a session uh, where we could have questions come in, and it was a time for us to be reminded of uh, within with examples to see how we can focus in Christ. There's also an option to give uh, a topic suggestion where you can share any topics that you want us to address in the future meetings. And you can post that also in the same pigeonhole link, or you can just uh, send a chat to Ronnie Abraham or Godly Koshi. And uh, first of all, I would like uh, uh, love to thank God for this opportunity and the resources he has given to conduct this program. And uh, thank you, Brother Nate, for accepting our invitation to speak to us today and uh, once again we would thank all the participants for joining us on this call and we appreciate you taking some time uh, from your busy sh schedule to join us today we hope you're edified uh, and uh, uh, last but not the least i would love to thank the team members of the sow for doing all the groundwork for me making this meeting possible i really thank uh, and praise god for each and every one of you and uh, we would love uh, Nate to end this meeting with a prayer. And once, uh, one more thing, uh, just soon after the prayer, uh, we would love to have a photo sessions. So just uh, make sure that once the prayer is done, we would request all of you to open your videos and hold on with your spine. Over to you, Nate, for the prayer. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we do say hallowed be your name and we do say your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray that that rain would be evidenced in and through our life. We pray that every area of our life would be surrendered to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm just so thankful that even amidst the chaos of our world and the politics of our world that we know who sits on the throne of heaven and who does reign and who will reign forever. But Lord, right now, my desire, not just for myself, but for everyone else on this call, is that Christ would have full reign in our life. There is a throne which is at stake. There is a throne which is being contested in our life. And Father, we know that Jesus is Lord. We know that he's worthy. And we've placed our faith in him to save us. But Father, how we desire that moment by moment that he would be seen to others around us through the way that we love, through the way that we obey, through the way that we care, through the way that we speak, through the way that we act, through the priorities we show. Oh God, may we live lives wired for the kingdom, wired for eternity recognizing the things of this world will pass, but what's done for you will last forever. That we're to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to us. So it's to you that we commit our lives, and I pray if anyone is not saved, anyone has never come to the Lord Jesus and placed their faith in him for salvation, that they would recognize it's not about the life they've lived, good or bad, it's about Christ and what he's done for them. And that unless a man be born again, he'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. So I pray that lives would be saved today. We pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.